I was 10, 11, 12, I don't remember, in line for the movies. And my, there were two guys in line in front of us, like three or four people in front of us holding hands. And my mother pulled me to her, not my siblings, just me, and looked at my father and said, they're weird. Which just made me look at those guys and I went, oh, now I get it. I'm weird like they're weird. And, and I looked at them and I thought, they look happy, they look like they're in love. Um, I'll be fine. Inform brings you incredible stories. I left two days before the revolution. It killed me so hard. James has never experienced the taste of fruits that haven't been attacked by pesticides, just like he's never experienced a neighborhood that hasn't been attacked by bullets. Some things just go hand in hand. People say what's on their mind. I think that it is a, um, a cardinal sin to lie to the American people um, about war. Partisanship is a version of narcissism. In downtown San Francisco, the Commonwealth Clubs and Forum curates events that bring you face to face with the world's changemakers. One third of the wage gains that women have made since the 1960s were made as a result of the birth control pill. Twitter is a technology that I don't think we've seen before in this world. Since 1903, the most innovative leaders have come to the Commonwealth Club to share their vision. Sharing cars, sharing their homes, sharing, sharing a shared dream, a shareable American dream. That could work. You each can play a role in helping us chart a better future. Housing and health and education and policy all live close to the surface in us when our children are murdered. It's all the same story. We bring together the visionaries shaping the emerging trends in technology. It was a combination of instant and telegram. It was the idea that you could take a moment in time and you could capture it and you could just send it out and broadcast it with the entire world. I just threw the site together in about a week when I was at school. Oh, great. We've got angels, we've got incubators, we've got accelerators, we've got seed funds, we've got crowdfunding. We eat, we drink. <laughs> One of our first dates ever, we pickled like 100 pounds of herring and made 300 Definitely pounds of nerds. sauerkraut. Wow. Yay! Yay! We never shy away. 75% of the people of this country want universal health care and expect it. And damn it, let's go. Concentrated, deep, slow, loving, tender, passionate sex. Whether you want to be on the cusp of current events or feast on pop culture. I should have a great time writing. I should write a book that is as fun as any party I'd be skipping. Inform events are fun and action-packed. I have a sh an anthropology scarf that does that <laughs> twisty thing, so. Come feed your mind and soul and celebrate the future with Inform. I love San Francisco, and every time I come back here, I remember that this is the only city I'm Crystal Contreras and I'm the director of Inforum. Welcome to today's program, Making Change with Sean King. King is a writer, an activist, co-founder of the Real Justice Pack, and author of the new book, Make Change, How to Fight Injustice, Dismantle Systemic Oppression, and Own Our Future. This conversation is moderated by former San Francisco supervisor, Jane Kim. If you'd like to ask either of our speakers a question during this program, you can do so in either the chat or comment section of the live stream that you're watching. The Commonwealth Club has temporarily suspended in-person events, but to keep you informed during this pandemic, we're going full speed ahead with the full slate of live online programs. Most of these conversations are currently free to the public, so we do ask that you consider donating to the club to help us continue our work. Please visit us at commonwealthclub.org slash online to learn more, and you can also text the word donate to 415-329-4231 during this program. You can find this information in the description box below. Now, please join me in welcoming Sean King and Jane Kim to Inform. Um, welcome to today's virtual program with Inform and the Commonwealth Club. My name is Jane Kim. I served as a supervisor here in the city and county of San Francisco. And most recently, 
um, as the California and National Regional Political Director for Bernie 2020, where I got to work very closely with Sean um, campaigning for Senator Sanders. Um, I'm really pleased to be here today. I'm so excited. Sean, um, what an incredible feat. Congratulations on writing your first book. Thank you. Um, honestly, there are not too many things that scare me more than writing a book. And so <laughs> I would love to talk about yeah. make change, how to fight injustice, dismantle system systematic oppression, and own our future. Um, Sean is going to share with us a little bit about his journey um, and the book. And as mentioned, um, if you have a question, please um, put it in the chat and it will show up and we will um, reserve time um, at the end to have that discussion. But I uh, wanted to start um, with your book right here. Folks can, um, can order it on the link that um, Commonwealth has put up, but we also encourage you to go and buy it at an independent bookstore in your neighborhood. Here in the Bay Area, we have a Black-owned bookstore in Oakland, Marcus. Um, yep. We encourage you to go there and buy the book and to support um, people of color and Black-owned businesses. And Sean, I just wanted to go to you about um, what the process was like to write this book, because I can't imagine anything more difficult than telling your own story. <laughs> yeah. Well, well, Jane, I'm glad to be here with you. And uh, I'm so bummed. You know, we had originally planned on doing this as a live event all the way back in May. And my mm -hmm. book was going to come out in April. And I love the Bay Area. And uh, I think about moving out there all the time. It's like, I just such good energy. We'd be so excited. <laughs> well, I love the Bay and so many of my closest friends are there. And um, I was so looking forward to making the trip. And in fact, my whole family, my wife, we have five kids. We had all taken off of work and we were going to take off of school and we were going to do that tour together. We had 30 different mm -hmm. venues around the country. And I worked for almost a year writing the book. And for me, um, you know, I always have my hands in so many different campaigns and actions and, and, and mm -hmm. we're always fighting for justice for so many people. It was really just about having the daily discipline of doing the research that I did for the book and then just writing daily every day for, for months on end. And I'll never look at a book on a shelf the same again because mm. it was like a year of hard work of and it took almost as long to really edit and perfect the book as it did to write it. And uh, it's a labor of love. It's, it comes, it's not, it's not an autobiography. Like I hope one day to be able to write a book that's just about my story, but it's really about my philosophy of change. It's a, it's a, it's a manifesto on how you can use your life to make change. And Jane, it's really, the book is really an answer to a question that I got all over the country. I, I traveled from 2014 when the Black Lives Matter movement began until right before the pandemic. I traveled to 47 different states, of course, all over California, but as, as far north as Alaska, as far west as Hawaii. I and mean, I traveled to the deep south and the Mississippi Delta, all over South Carolina and everywhere you could imagine, all, all but three states. And everywhere I would go, I would get one question and my book is really an answer to that question. People would ask me from all political persuasions, all ages, they would want to know, Sean, I'm frustrated about injustice. I'm frustrated about police brutality, but how do I actually use my life to change that thing? And everywhere I would go, if I was speaking, if I was walking on the streets, even as, as recently as today, I get, direct messages and emails of some version of that question. Uh, and there's a gap there of people being like really, really aware of what's wrong with the world, but not really clear on what exactly to do about it. Mm -hmm. And in the book, I'm trying to close that gap to show you, here are some things you could do to use your life to make change and change. And you and I know this, it never just happens. You have to craft it. You have to hone it. You have to build it. You have to make it. And I'm trying to unpack what that actually means in the book. No, I thought you really articulated that well um, in weaving that 
that question or the answer to that question with your story. And in talking to young people who know that this is the pathway they want to pursue, I'm also constantly asked the question of how do I do it? Yeah. I want to make a change. How do I do it? And, you know, when I was a youth organizer, um, the, the biggest lesson I learned, because you know how there's those young people, right? You're like, oh, I'm never going to reach that young person, mm. um, either because they're too cool for school or maybe because they're super quiet, super shy, right? And I think one of the most beautiful parts of the organizing work was discovering that there's always like every young person or every person wants to make a difference. Every person wants to make a positive contribution to their community. It's all about providing the, the tools maybe, or shedding light on the pathway of how to get there. And school doesn't necessarily teach you that, you know, I, I, I have as as much education as as most people I I did. I'm trying to do the math in in my mind. Like, I I went to school for almost 20 years. Mm -hmm. And in all of that education, there was never a place where people really unpacked, here is how you change the world. Mm -hmm. And and I even say why that is in the book. In a lot of Mm -hmm. ways, it's because most of our institutions weren't built to change the world. Most of our institutions were built to maintain it. They were built to protect it. Most of our, even our favorite institutions, even our religious institutions and other, uh, other organizations, even some of our favorite charities, um, even the nation's leading political parties, they weren't necessarily built for change. A lot of times they were built to protect the way things are. Mm -hmm. And, and so when you try to say, I don't really like the way things are and I want to change it to look like this. The whole system in some ways kind of conspires against you being able to do that. And for years I did the things that I thought would work to make change. And I tell a lot of these stories really of a failure of us organizing, demonstrating, protesting, and all of those things. I'm glad we did. We weren't wrong to do them. But what I learned it was a painful lesson after years of, of organizing, protesting, demonstrating, creating hashtags, trending topics. What I learned is that this country in particular, more than most countries in the world, is fully willing to be aware of our worst problems, be it police brutality and mass incarceration, or it could be, uh, it could be climate change. It could be uh, wealth and income disparities. It could be our healthcare crisis. And now nearly 50 million people in this country don't have health insurance right now. Some estimates have the number even much higher if you count children. And our country is fully willing to say, I see that problem. Even I'm sorry for that problem, but then do nothing about it. So there's just this awareness, but often people in power want to substitute awareness for action. And Mm -hmm. I'm afraid I'm seeing that even right now of of even beloved political figures, uh, the nation's leading corporations and brands saying, listen, black lives matter to us. And then you you ask them, well, well, how do black lives matter? Show us the policies that you're fighting for. Or even if it's corporations, we're starting to say, hey, if black lives matter to you, show us show us your board show us your show us your senior staff right. and That's uh, right. and so we're starting to say like hey thank you for your awareness but we are asking and demanding more than awareness we're looking for action and change and there's just this big gap and i'm i'm hoping to give people some clear steps on how they can fill that gap in their own lives you know that was one of the kind of the narrowness that I heard people approach Black Lives Matters. Because when you just focus on reforming the police, which honestly is like the end of the road, right? right? There's so many steps before that. Oh, yeah. That we, so many institutions that we need to reform, how we employ people, who we invest in, how our schools are run, you know, who we elect, right? That, that the police almost became an easy scapegoat for so many folks. If we just reform the police, then we'll, you know, go to yeah. Mecca, right? In terms of the the post-racist country that right. we all want to live in. And that actually 
brings me to a question that one member of our audience asked, um, which is to both of us, um, what do you say to young people who are discouraged by the nominees of both major parties being old white men? And, well, yeah. Yeah, and how go, do you think ahead, young people, right? Uh, the, the rest of the question is, you know, how, how do you think young people can engage with and demand to have a seat at that table, mm. right? As we talk about that reform. Yeah. I mean, um, I have five children and my oldest are 18 and 20. And people are surprised when I say that because they don't think I'm old enough to have a 20 year old. But I was almost a kid when I started having kids. And so I've been a father literally for my entire adult life. And my oldest two daughters, who are both college students, 18 and 20, are severely disappointed at the political nominees for president. Obviously, mm -hmm. they would never have supported Donald Trump. But mm -hmm. there's real pain and disappointment because Joe Biden was literally on every poll by every measure, the last preference of every major candidate for young people. Mm -hmm. They literally preferred about nine other people over him. And mm -hmm. so they're they're learning a hard lesson very quickly that me and you and every person who's ever voted for voted before learned a long time ago is it's actually rare that you get to vote for somebody that you're crazy about. <laughs> it's way more rare than I wish. And when you do get to vote for somebody that looks like you or comes from your community or better yet actually shares your political philosophy you have to cherish that moment you have to fight for that moment because for most i'm 40 for most of my adult life i actually have never been enthusiastic about the people i had to vote for for senate for congress for president and and young people who are voting for the first time are learning that a lot of times uh you have to be I don't know if the word is pragmatic, but there is there is disappointment in mm -hmm. the availability of candidates and, and politics. There have been some candidates, including Bernie, who have, who have ignited the, the imaginations of young people of dreaming about what could be. And when you have a candidate who seems to not have an imagination, who is not so hopeful about what things could, how things could happen, it's disappointing, but you can't check out of our democracy. And um, there are so many other down ballot candidates to be excited about. And, yes. and the, truth, and the yes. truth is, the truth is, there is a difference. You know, for years I used in, in previous presidential elections, I used the the words like lesser of two evils. And I don't even quite think that's I, I don't think that Donald Trump and Joe Biden are are comparable in their in their politics or even in their even in their character nobody has been a bigger critic of joe biden than me and like i don't think i would ever be invited or welcomed into a joe biden white house you know like i've written incredibly well, we got to work on that <laughs> you know i've written deeply detailed critiques of his role in building mass incarceration and even with that i understand that for people i fight for Donald Trump is an existential threat in a way that Joe Biden isn't. Mm -hmm. And for me, it's one of the first times that uh, I am I am going to be voting to oust a candidate versus voting for a candidate that I really am excited about. And and so um, it's difficult, you know, it's mm -hmm. it's but it is a part of American democracy. Um we were, Jane, we were really close. Uh, obviously, Bernie won California, and we all, you and me and so many thousands of volunteers and staffers, worked our hearts out. And, and I use Bernie as a guide for me in some ways. My thing is, if he is able to pivot after such a disappointing loss, and he gave more to this race than than anybody from his own life and his own his own time if he's able to pivot i feel in some ways that i even owe it uh owe it to him to be able to find a way to pivot as well and not 
not get stuck in my frustration. And, and by the way, I want to acknowledge that that question came from Lynn on YouTube. Oh, thanks. I, I have to say that um, I never thought I would run for office. Sean. <laughs> you know, I was reading your story about how you were that activist with the megaphone and the battery yeah. pack. Yeah. <laughs> I was that activist in college. Yep, I was, was me. radical. I was rah, rah. I didn't believe in politicians. And I always viewed voting as a very disempowering exercise because I always thought it was voting between the lesser of two evils. Yeah, right. I was never excited about anyone I was voting for. And it was only as an organizer where I got involved at the neighborhood and community level that I started going to my local school board meeting yeah. and my local city council meeting. And I started to realize that actually the most important thing that our elected representatives do is they determine how to spend our dollars. Oh, yeah. And we should have a seat at that table. Yep. And, you know, a lot of my friends didn't understand what I did. But when I served on the board, we had a $10 billion budget. And so I would tell my friends, well, I work for a $10 billion foundation. Right. But my board isn't one wealthy That's individual right. or family. It's That's it's right. everyone because everyone paid into that fund. Yeah, a million and, people. And we should be voting on these down-ballot races because they are they are determining how to spend our money back into our community. Yeah. And so yeah. that budget, how much we pay teachers, mm -hmm. police officers, parks, streets, and in which neighborhoods we invest them in, that 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 budget is a is a document that reflects our values and our priorities. It's yeah. not just line numbers and dollar signs. So I'm always encouraging folks to to think about down ballot and you know if you're not excited about Biden and Kamala, because that's actually the second question. Yeah. You know, start organizing for those local races because there's a lot happening in your community. And I think, you know, grassroots law, what you're trying to do and activating folks in, in a variety of cities, because we know these police departments, it, it's not the federal government or even the governor. It's they're actually run by cities. That's right. And so, you know, love to hear a little bit more about grassroots. And then yeah. I want to come back to the book. Yeah. Well, you know. First, you said something uh, a few minutes ago about the goals and objectives even of the Black Lives Matter movement, that policing is just a fraction of what we're fighting for. And it reminded me of, uh, Jane, when I first moved. I've lived in California on two different occasions. I've lived in Southern California twice for almost five years. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. when I first moved to California, uh, we moved to Irvine. And, and we here's how we ended up in Irvine. Uh, we had never lived in California before, and we literally Googled safest cities in Southern California. Mm. And, and Irvine that year, which I think was 2013, was actually listed as the safest city in America. Mm. And when we moved out to Irvine, I had been there for about three weeks and something dawned on me. I had never seen I had never saw a police car, not not parked on the road, not driving on the road. We were there for four weeks, five weeks, six weeks. I was there for almost eight weeks before I saw the first police car. Now, mind you, mm -hmm. this is in America's safest city. And so I literally asked a friend of mine, even then when I saw the police car, it was parked in the, a parking lot of a grocery store. And I asked my friend, like, is there a police department in Irvine? And he said, yeah. And he took me and he showed me the police department, showed me the jail, was tucked behind somewhere. So here, Irvine is the safest city in America, but Irvine's not safe because there are police everywhere. Now, that's how they want to define safety for particular communities. Irvine was the safest city in America because everybody had not only a job, but a well-paying job. Everybody was covered with health insurance. I saw something that had, you know, like Irvine was like 99% insured. They had hospitals that were as beautiful as shopping malls there were parks on every corner all mm -hmm. of the schools were well resourced like irvine was safe for very different metrics it wasn't safe yeah. because it was over policed it was mm -hmm. safe because it was built to be safe mm -hmm. it was built and fashioned and funded and supported in a way that safety was just a, a part of the fabric of the town it wasn't because there weren't drugs in Irvine. My, my daughter started ninth grade there the year we moved there. And the first day she got there, she came home and she was alarmed. She had been homeschooled for six years. And she said kids all over the school were not only talking about drugs, 
but they were pat they were giving drugs to each other selling drugs to each other and when kids got caught with drugs in Irvine their parents sent them to treatment they didn't get arrested mm. they, it, they were treated as if they had substance abuse problems mm-hmm. it was a it was a function of their privilege that instead of being arrested over and over again kids in her school were given outpatient treatment they weren't sometimes weren't even suspended from school and mm. and so all of a sudden you realize like no this place was designed to be safe from the way they do their math, from the way they they factor in safety. And so it's very different. And, mm-hmm. and in the Black Lives Matter movement, you also mentioned budgets. That's what defund the police is about. When we're talking about defunding the police, just to translate it to those who may be watching now or, or who might watch it later, when we say defund the police, what we're saying is we just want to look at the police's budget. We want to see... In cities like Los Angeles, where policing is now over 50 percent of the city's general fund to the tune of billions of dollars in some cities. And so we're saying, I think it's a smart evolution of the Black Lives Matter movement to say, you know what, if Black Lives Matter, let me see it matter in your budget. Let me see how Black Lives Matter on the line items that you mentioned, Jane. And um, it's important for us to understand as Dr. King said, that that budgets are moral documents. They Mm -hmm. do. They show intention. So if you love children, show me in your budget how you love children. Yes. You know, you you know, Mm -hmm. whatever it is you say you love. I was a I was a Christian pastor for many years, Jane. And in the Bible, there's a scripture that says uh, where your treasure is there, your heart will be also. In other words, your your money shows where your heart is. And what we're saying is a, a budget shows your priorities. And mm-hmm. right now in America, budgets show that cities value mass incarceration. They value policing at all cost. And you and I talked earlier, when you actually ask the people, what do you prefer? That's not really what people want to be the highest priority. They, they do want to be safe. But there's safety all around the world without millions and millions of police officers. So there's a mm-hmm. there's a real path to doing it. And um, yep. in the Grassroots Law Project, what we're trying to do is organize people, just as you said, on the city level. Because as much as the presidential campaign and election matters, and it does matter, 95% of all people who are arrested are arrested through their local police department because of local laws and policies, they're processed through the local district attorney's office. And the truth is, even when we had President Obama in office, there was very little that he did that trickled down to local police departments. And so when we're organizing on policing, that's a local fight. And, and yeah. we're doing it in the Bay. There are cases that we're taking on in the Bay and uh, cases that we're working on all around the country. Um, we're working with the family of Breonna Taylor, the family of, of George Floyd, of, of Ahmaud Aubrey, of these cases. And Sean Monterosa. Sean Monterosa in the Bay Area, who Sean, who was shot and killed amidst protests for George Floyd. Uh, mm-hmm. Sean, who was just 20 years old, the very last text he sent his sister was a petition to sign for George Floyd. And um, uh, police... You know, not only did they shoot and kill Sean, but they have now lied about it. The district attorney has has recused herself, and we're saying, listen, there still has to be justice. And I wish the case could be tried in San Francisco. Sean lived in San Francisco for a big chunk of his life, and I think we could actually get some measure of justice if the case could be moved there. But uh, we'll wait and see. Yeah, and for audience members that don't know, Sean Monterosa is a San Franciscan City College of San Francisco student um, was shot and killed by the Vallejo Police Department in June um, through the windshield. They shot him through the windshield. He was kneeling on the ground, hands up. Through their windshield. They didn't even get out of the car. They didn't even get out of the car. Right. And they thought he, they said he had, they claimed he had a gun, but it turned out he had a hammer in his pocket and they didn't even give him a shot. And this 22 year old never saw the next day. Yeah, And I can't imagine anything more heartbreaking, but I will say the Vallejo city council is, is a small elected body. 
This mm-hmm. is a body we can influence. It yeah. is more moderate, but they need to hear from us. We have to attend these local city council meetings. They're not sexy. They're tedious. It's where um, change it can happens. Be hard to figure change. it out. That's right. Yeah, but that's where change happens. And to go to grassroots law, uh, grassroots law and the website to learn about how to engage because at the very local level, we can make that difference. And yeah. people are running right now for Vallejo City Council. Yeah. Candidates are running. And so we have to hold folks accountable right now while they're running for office. And we have yeah. um, the mayor's office is open. The The incumbent mayor is not running for reelection. This is the time to really mm-hmm. um, step up in that case. Um, and, and Sean, I, I, I wanted to go back you know, to the book because, and you talked about this in your first response, um, but just how there's no natural or easy pathway for folks to make change, right? There's no entry level job. You get hired here and then you slowly move your way up and then you become CEO. Right. And I think that often when I talk with young people and they meet me, you know, obviously they hear about my accomplishments, right? Our resume, our social media, it's about all the things that we've won, what we've accomplished. And, and I think that can be very intimidating for folks that are starting on the journey. But what doesn't get talked about as much is the path to getting there. And yeah. I always talk about how when I first graduated from college with my Asian American studies and political science degree, <laughs> you know, I was, I was really depressed. I didn't know what to do. I didn't know right. how I, I knew I wanted to make a difference, but I was really lost. Yeah. And and you feel the passion, you know, you want to do things, you see the injustice and, and you want to fight, but you don't exactly know where or how to start. And I think yeah. we don't talk enough about that, but you talk about that in your book, but like both the losses and the disappointments. Yeah. And, um, I mean, and also I, just like you go ahead, the Jane. depression right? oh, yeah. that many of us go through. And I think when young people go through that, they think that they're the only ones and they see leaders like you on social media and they aspire to be you, but they're like, oh, I could never be Sean. I'm, I, I'm so depressed about where I am. I, I don't oh, have yeah. the answers, right? And, and what do you say to young folks that are, and actually they don't have to be young. <laughs> yeah, no, <laughs> what do you anybody. Say to folks that are struggling yeah. um, to insert themselves to be that, that leader, that well, advocate. I- I think everybody's struggling, right? Yeah, I think everybody's struggling right now, Jane. You know, um, um, First Lady Michelle Obama did um, a recent episode on her podcast where she said she thought she was fighting through depression. Mm -hmm. And she talked about how it was kind of, uh, you know, environmental depression of, she said, even the the deaths of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor and Ahmaud Arbery and, and the state of our country and And uh, it was the first time anybody had ever heard her say that. And there is this expectation. Um, Here she is, one of the most famous women in the world with access to power and privilege and wealth. And and this moment is still overwhelming her. Mm. Pandemic is hard. Uh, Jane, Mm -hmm. I've, I have, I've delivered nearly 50 different eulogies for families just over the past few months who lost their loved ones to the coronavirus. In my own neighborhood where I live here in Brooklyn, I'm in my basement in Brooklyn right now. We have people who died on the block to the left of us, to the right of us, behind us. Uh, We've had businesses close all around here. And so like, this is a very, very painful year. It's It's a painful year for our country. Even if you removed the pandemic, this year would be hard, but you put the pandemic on top of all of it. So I understand how hard it is, how hard it feels. Um, You know, Jane, I tell the story in my book of most of what I have fought for in my life as an organizer, I I have lost or failed. Most of the Mm -hmm. candidates I have fought for have not won. Mm -hmm. Most of the families I fought for justice for did not get it. But what, what, what still wakes me up in the morning really is, is two things. One, every new day, a new family comes to me and they're not exhausted. They just now Mm -hmm. experience some type of injustice in this country. American police kill three or four people a day. And every day, almost every day, one of those families comes to me. And even though, I may be overwhelmed with all of the struggles and challenges of fighting for justice. 
they're still grasping for straws and they still need somebody to fight for them. And it can't always be me. It has to be people locally. It has to be people in Vallejo, in the Bay. It has to be people in, in New York or in Atlanta or in the Deep South fighting for Ahmaud Aubrey. And so some of it is, you know, I know that the cause that we're fighting for is still here and it's still calling on us and still needing us. But the flip of that is also true. The cause injustice is going to continue and not just with police brutality, but there, there are layers and layers of injustice in America. We, we could unpack it from many different angles. Sometimes when you are feeling down, you don't have to pretend that you don't feel that way. Sometimes you need to take a break. Sometimes mm -hmm. I have a therapist, Jane. I see a therapist, my family. We have a family therapist. Uh, there are free services that um, provide counseling as well. And if, you, if you're if uh, you privileged enough to have health insurance, it often covers therapy as well. Um, you know, there are lots of things that we have to do to fight through the feelings of despair. Um, and, and then lastly, I have had enough victories to know that victory is possible. There are families yeah, yeah. that we have fought for that did get justice. Just less than two months ago, uh, our team at the Grassroots Law Project fought for a law in Louisville called the Brianna, called Brianna's Law that banned no-knock warrants. And, and it passed unanimously in Louisville. And it's the most strict no-knock warrant ban in the country. And nobody in Louisville will ever die the way Brianna Taylor died again. And our team had a big part in that. We worked with the Again, that's a local law. We work with the city councilors uh, who who wrote it and, and crafted it, and we walked that thing all the way through. And so when you have those victories, you have to celebrate them. You have to hold on to them and, and cherish them. Um, but, but sometimes, you know, as an organizer, even most of the time as an organizer, you won't always get what you're fighting for. Sometimes you, you get closer. Uh, sometimes you move the needle. But, uh, but you don't always get what you're fighting for, but it's worth the fight. And mm -hmm. part of what I've had to also communicate um, to, to organizers, and, and instead of saying young organizers, I would think of it more as like as new organizers, because you may be any age, but you're new to, to seeing yourself as an organizer or an activist. Sometimes what you do is loosen the lid on the jar. You don't even you don't even get it all the way all the way off, but you just loosen it a little bit and the next person may loosen it a little bit more. And sometimes I just know that even my own efforts are just a small part of a, of a bigger story. And I just want people to know, particularly people who are advancing systemic oppression or racism or bigotry. I just don't want them to think that they can get away with it in silence that we're going to say nothing or do nothing. Even if I know I can't change an issue, I'm going to make sure that people who advance bigotry and hate and ugliness in this country, that they at least see us fighting back every chance we get. Yeah, no, I, um, you know, I, I've run in now six elections and I've, I've won three and I've lost three. Right. And right. like you, <laughs> like you, I've campaigned for a lot of folks that haven't won. Although, really proud that we were able to campaign together for Chester Boudin for San yeah. Francisco district yeah. attorney. Um, and that we have him now as a criminal justice leader here in the city. But I was really moved by something that actually my meditation teacher had taught me uh, or had said to me, which was that you can't ever lose if you get up the next day and keep fighting. Hmm. Right. If you, if you, it's not just um, it's not just resistance, it's persistence, mm -hmm. right? The persistence to never stop believing. And even if I lose this battle, if I get up the next day to continue fighting, I haven't lost, right? right. And that's, that's part of that work yep. is that we just got to keep getting up the next day because there are going to be a lot of losses. And I think, you know, people always ask me, they're like, well, what made you want to go into public service? And I always say, well, I, I think that's a really easy question to answer. I mean, who doesn't want to make a positive change for their community? I think the much more difficult question to answer is, why do you keep continuing to do this work? 
because yeah. it is so disappointing. It is so difficult. It's, um, it's demoralizing. And, and the one thing I've had to learn to share space with, and this is one of the questions that Nancy on YouTube asked is, you know, I, I had, I've had to learn to sit with pain mm. and to cry on a regular basis and know yeah. that that's part of what keeps me going every day, right? To not lose touch with those emotions because they're hard. And, and Nancy asked, you know, she wanted to know how you maintain your commitment, energy, and motivation. And I think mm. you talked a little bit about that. But I also want to expand on that because someone in your position, you know, I, I, I meet a lot of leaders who are pulled in. 300 different directions. Everyone's yeah. asking for something. Everyone wants a piece of you, right? And I have to say the one thing I've always been struck by you is your immense generosity in the moment of spending time with folks and listening to them and responding to everyone. That's very hard to do. A lot of folks in your position, you know, it's just hard. Well, you know, right? it, and how do you it, how do you maintain that? Yeah, I think it has a lot to do with even how, you know, not just how I was raised, but even the arc of my life, you know, before I was an activist and organizer, I was, I had a lot of roles that required me to be very present. Mm -hmm. I was a high school history and civics teacher. Uh, mm -hmm. Like, and, and when you're a school teacher, you're just on, you, there mm -hmm. are there's no off switch. <laughs> you just have to be present and you have to be committed. Uh, for over three years after I left that that position, I taught for three years in Atlanta's jails and prisons at, at 13 different jails and prisons all over Metro Atlanta full time. Mm -hmm. And that was a position, again, where I had to be like uber present and committed and 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 look young people in the eye and they had to know. Like, you know, forgive my language, like they could, well, I, I'll, I'll censor myself. They could see BS from a mile away. Yep. And these were young mm -hmm. people who had been lied to and mistreated. So I, had, I just had to be there and be fully present and fully myself. Then I was a pastor for almost 15 years. And as a pastor, I led families through their hardest days and sometimes their worst moments of, of loss, of death. I mean, I was there for them at high moments of, of, of birth and marriage and things like that as well. But a huge part of what I did as a pastor was to just be a witness and be present with people when they had experienced tremendous loss. And so now as I travel as an organizer, as a leader, uh, I lean on a lot of that history of just being mm -hmm. there, of being present, you know, normally until the last person leaves, before the pandemic, I would shake every hand, take every photo. <laughs> and uh, some of that you also, did. yeah, and some of it was I knew that for a lot of people, this might be the last time I, I'd ever get a chance to meet them or see them, even not to be morbid, but even like in my own life, I know that tomorrow's, tomorrow's not promised, even with the safety risk and things that I face on a daily basis. And so wherever I would go, I would always try to treat like if that was the last place I spoke, I wanted people to have had a good experience where they learned something and they had a, a, a real human encounter with somebody that they knew cared about them. But, um, you know, there are a lot of things that I do. Uh, uh, I have a whole chapter in the book. It's, it's the next to last chapter that is about self-care. And that's a buzzword in a way. But I, I talk about some of the strategies that I have for self-care, for healthy boundaries. Uh, and I say that as somebody, it's taken me pretty much all 40 years of my life to to start developing a lot of those systems. I I wasn't born with with healthy habits and I didn't even have them for most of my 20s and deep into my 30s. I've hit a wall several times as an organ. I don't mean I have felt like physically hitting a wall many times in my life as a leader and organizer, but. I've hit a wall where I was just either completely exhausted or de depleted or discouraged. And in those moments, um, I'm also grateful that I have uh, people that love me, to care for me, to look out for me. Even if you don't have a, a close family or friend unit, you have to know when to unplug. And I've had to say this to activists and organizers everywhere, Jane, this feeling 
that the world or the cause can't do without you for a day or a week or a month is a it's a it's it's an exaggerated sense of self-importance there is there's is no cause in the world that's going to crumble if we're not there for a few days or a few weeks sadly that's right injustice is going to go on and whatever problem was there it's still going to be there when you take some time to care for yourself and return and uh you know this it sounds cliche but you know doing good work is very much a marathon and so i i turn my phone off at night for instance um late at night when i go upstairs tonight it's uh almost 10 p.m. here on the east coast when i go upstairs uh, I'll cut my phone all the way off. And if anybody, if it's an emergency, somebody will have to call my wife or somebody else, but I don't look at the news. I don't watch the news in bed. Um, I try to just create disconnect so I can try to turn my mind off and, and try to get rest. Rest is a huge part of it as well. Um, yeah. I try not to look at even, I try not to try not to work, work late into the night. I mean, I have cutoff points that yep. allow me to have boundaries. Um, yep. I don't work and eat at the same time. When I eat, I just eat. I eat and talk. I eat and enjoy the food. I might eat and, and look at something fun. But I try to give myself little pockets of, of respite throughout the day that allow me to decompress. I think, you know, oftentimes those of us in public service view ourselves as martyrs. Yeah, and. Sure. And what I've often seen, and you know, we're we're about the same age. You know, not a lot of folks that were that I organized with in my twenties are still around now yeah, in our forties. Same, same. And so that boundary is so important. And you know, there are all these things I used to make fun of. You know, eating. You know, eating uh, well. Yeah. Yoga, even I didn't understand yoga or meditation. Uh, now every year I do a seven day silent meditation retreat. Wow. You know, because you have to, you know, you can take that time off. It was scary the first time I did it. How can I unplug for seven days? Will people survive without me? And <laughs> and they do. <laughs> they do. <laughs> they they, they damn survive. sure do. They, 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 <laughs> the world moves on the world without keeps, you. Yeah. The world keeps moving on without you. And, um, you know, more importantly, I want to still be here 40 years from now. Yeah, me too. And, you know, the long term, I'm, I'm, I'm in it for the, for the well, long I, made, term. I made a commitment, Jane, even to my family, to my wife and kids and, you know, many of my heroes. I'm grateful that I, I'm friends with the children of Dr. King, of Malcolm X and others. These are these are women who women and men who lost whose dads died at, at age 39. I'm 40. And I've done a lot of things that I, I never say out loud to even keep myself safe. Um, I. I've made promises to both my wife and kids that I would try to be here for as long as possible. And, and that sounds, that may sound strange to people, but a lot of great leaders, even if they're not killed, they burn out in so many ways. They sometimes the work wears them down. They can create, you know, incredibly unhealthy habits and other things. And I've tried my best to be as healthy and stable as I can. Mm -hmm. I, I want to be here too. And, um, you know, it, that, that requires me to, to say no. Um, that's a learned behavior as well. I mean, I think, you know, for a lot of my young organizing life, I said yes to everything and allow myself to over, over commit in ways that I, I couldn't deliver to people, even if I wanted to, because I just said yes mm -hmm. too much. And so now I'm, I still want to be able to, to help as many people as possible, but I have to be just, I just have to exercise wisdom in doing that work. Well, you still say yes a lot, but yeah. I will say, you know, a woman who has become like a coach or a mentor to me told me, you know, just remember every time you say yes, you are saying no to something else. Oh yeah, for sure. Yeah. So, absolutely. you know, if it's hard for you to say no, just know that yes is also no to something else. So you're saying yeah. yes to one thing as a no for to sure. something else. Yeah. Um, standing up, and this comes up a lot in your book. It's hard, mm. right? And um, actually, we were talking about budgets and how we invest 
our dollars, by the way, because we all pay into it every time we buy Absolutely. groceries, yep. when we have a job, yep. when we buy a house, you know, all of those money goes into this pool. Yep. And I remember in 2015, you know, this is after Michael Brown and Eric Garner, one of my colleagues introduced a resolution to hire 300 more police officers. Mm. Now here in San Francisco, each police officer is roughly about $170,000 per head. Yeah. With Not benefits, training, time, and everything else, right. right? Not including all those other things. And I remember coming out to oppose it, and I was really scared that day because I knew, you know, I would get a lot of backlash from the constituents that I represent. And the only thing that I could say that day is that it would be, you know, the real question is, what does it take to make our city safer? Right, that question that you talked about with Irvine. Mm-hmm. So if we're talking about 300 officers times times 171 thousand dollars, right? As an elected, it'd actually, be easy for me to commit to 300 police officers because I know I can do that. But can I promise to make the city safer? Right. That's a much more difficult commitment yeah. to make as an elected. And I remember asking the question, you know, what if we invested in 300 of our most at-risk families mm. and gave them 171 thousand dollars every year? Right. Would our right. city be safer? Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, of course, you know, after that, you know, I, I actually ran against this colleague in 2016 and he put out mailers about how I don't believe in the police. And that I actually mm. said this, the police, um, police don't prevent crime. Yeah, they're, they're there to address it. Yeah, that's right. But schools yeah. prevent crime. Right. You know, after school programs prevent crime, parks prevent crime. Like there are other things that we can invest in. Um, and so when you feel that force of that, um, it becomes difficult to stand up, right? Mm. And and I know you have been posting recently about death threats, not yeah. just against you, which is one thing, but your family too. Yeah, from officers and in California, actually. From officers yeah. in California on yeah. Facebook. Yeah. Crazy. Um, yeah. how, do you, how do you continue to stand up in the face of all of the challenges yeah. and the fear mongering, the hate, you know, that's thrown at you. Well, it is discouraging. You know, first, I just want to be honest about it. You know, when somebody, I get death threats almost every day. Normally they're anonymous and normally they seem like they are not real, but designed to intimidate and frighten my family. Mm-hmm. This last incident, though, was of current officers and former retired officers that were in a Facebook group for police officers in California who were using their real names, their real identities, and were actually plotting on how they were going to to cause harm to me and my family. And they were talking about it openly. They weren't joking. They were dead serious. They were asking each other to email each other for steps and directions. And when somebody in that, somebody in the group, an, an officer in the group, was so alarmed that they told a friend who they knew knew me. And that person reached out to me to tell me that. And normally I am pretty unflappable when I see these things. But when I saw the screenshots, I realized like, no, I think they actually mean this. And I was in a weird position because who do you call when you're being threatened by the police? You can't call the police. And and it put me in a in a position that I felt like I didn't necessarily have anywhere to go. And so I felt like I needed to share it publicly. And my family was deeply discouraged. And, you know, right now, Jane, we have security at our house. And and so I have some level of safety and security in that sense. But it's very frustrating that fighting for change, fighting for justice fighting for people uh, then puts me and my family and others in harm's way. And now I've said this, my wife and my mother are two of my biggest supporters, but, but both of them have asked me multiple times, like Sean, could you find anything else to do? You know, and in my wife jokes, she, oh, she, she wants me to either go back to being a teacher or for some reason, she always asked me if I would be a mailman. <laughs> and I'm like, well, I don't know why she chooses mailman as the profession that she, she just wants me to do anything other than what I'm doing. And I feel, um, I feel a sense of guilt 
that I don't pivot and stop because it puts my family in, in harm's way. And so, you know, the, the work can be heavy and I just don't want to deny that it, it's, um, you know, thankfully I, I'm surrounded with coworkers and colleagues, friends, the families that I fight for and fight with, I'm very mm-hmm. close with them. And, and all of them help keep me encouraged through it. Um, ultimately, even, even as a father of my kids range from elementary school, middle school, high school, and college, I'm even a lot of the fighting that I do and standing up that I do, I do with the hope that I can change and impact society for them. And, um, and so some of the work I do, I don't want to use them as a scapegoat to say, I'm just doing it for them, but I'm hoping that I can make this country a better, safer, more equitable place for Mm -hmm. them and for, for families all over the country. So speaking of social media, um, Jack on YouTube asked, do you think social media has been more helpful or harmful to organizing? Mm -hmm. And what about to politics in general? That's a great question. I talk about it a lot in the book from, from cover to cover. I think that, uh, I think that Jack, by the way, I, I love that you used a book to talk about social media. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. You know, uh, I think people who read the book are going to be super surprised because people know me as somebody who uses social media as a tool, but I have, I have seen the shortcomings of it. it you know, it it does a couple things well. It allows people who otherwise may never know each other, who share similar affinities, to then find each other in a way that that otherwise might not be able to happen. In in 1999, I was student government president at Morehouse, and we were organizing for a young brother named Amadou Diallo who had been shot and killed by the NYPD. We couldn't find anybody else who cared. Like we were struggling. There was no mm-hmm. Twitter. There was no Facebook. Mm-hmm. So like, you had to put up flyers and hope yep. that somebody saw the flyer and came to the interest meeting. And it was hard. And so social media has changed that. But social media, it's not just an, a, a place for people of good affinities to find one another. Social media also allows people who, who are hateful, who are, who are bigots, who are xenophobes, who are misogynistic. Like it allows all of them to find one another and support one another as well. And so while it can be this tool for good, I don't think you ever would have had uh, President Donald Trump without social media. I don't think any expert in the world. I agree with that. Yeah, I don't think there's there's no path to him ever being president without Twitter. And I agree. And so, you know, in some ways he is the he is Twitter's Frankenstein. He is he Mm -hmm. is the the monster that social media created. And yet here we are also using social media to fight back against injustice, to rally each other, to connect with one another. So it's it's not evil uh, and it's certainly not all good. Um, But what I see is those who want to use it for evil, for good, for for. You know, like it it just depends on how much effort you're going to put into it. And what we often Mm -hmm. see is, you know, I even try to say this in the book, Jane, is that some people who are fighting for the worst things just use these tools really, really well. And um, the good news of that is, you know, we can find ways to use these tools in, in ways that matter as well. We can't always think that like it's just it's just destiny or it's just the way things are anything that can be used to advance a horrible agenda we can use those same tools to advance our dreams our goals and to organize one each, one another in ways that matter you know i i mean just as social media created president trump you know social media also created black lives matters and even you know you know, for the Donald Trump, there's also AOC, right? Yep. And, you know, I always am struck by this history, you know, and learning about the Civil Rights Act and Voting Rights Act of 1964 and the Immigration Rights Act of 1965. Yep. 
yes, there were very good people that fought for that. And there were also good electeds that wanted to pass those acts because they were the right thing. But actually, you know, the lesser known part of that history was the backdrop of the Cold War mm. and how the U.S. and USSR were fighting for the hearts and minds of Asians and Latin Americans and Africans. Mm -hmm. And, you know, one of the things that really supported the USSR and communism in these quote unquote third world countries, countries of color was actually the invention of the television. Right. Right. And it was when the TV came that for the first time, Asians and Africans and Latin Americans saw white Americans beating, posing, mm -hmm. throwing dogs on peaceful black and white protesters. Yeah. And, and the USSR went to Asia and Latin America and they were like, why would you want to be like the Americans? Right. They're racist capitalists. And, and actually countries in Asia and Latin America started closing their markets to U S yeah, companies. For sure. And it was when that started to happen that Congress realized that they had an optics issue. Mm. And that that was, if you read the congressional records, yes, there were good people fighting for the Civil Rights Act, Voting Rights Act, Immigration Act, but it was also people motivated by U.S. companies having access to as many markets as possible mm -hmm. that pushed these acts because America did not want to lose the Cold War to communism, right? And, and, and knowing that history, that the TV helped kind of accelerate the civil rights movement, yeah. same way the cell phone camera help to accelerate Black Lives Matters because police brutality has been happening for centuries here yeah. in the United States. Technology, um, yeah, technology has changed those things and impacted these things in a major way. Yeah. And so I, I know that I'm here because of the civil rights movement. My parents came because of the 1965 Immigration Act. Yeah. And we would not be here if not for the bodies of Black, largely Black and white civil rights movement protesters that fought you know, and, and so, you know, I'm, I'm a product of, of black history. I'm a product of the civil rights movement, me being here in this country and, and even being able to now, you know, it's crazy as a daughter of immigrants, a woman of color, I get to run for office now right? And be taken right. seriously. I mean, that's crazy. Yeah. Right. Um, but it's, you know, it's so important to understand our, our point in this lineage. I see that we have, um, eight minutes remaining. Yeah. Um, I kind of want to get through as, as many of these questions. There's a number of questions now. I'll today. try to get it. I'll I, try to get as yeah. I'll try to get as many yeah. questions as we can. <laughs> a lot of questions today about Biden's pick yeah. for vice president. A lot of folks want to know how you feel about uh -huh. um, Vice President Kamala Harris, and you know how folks, especially those in the movement, Youth for Black Lives, who are not actively supporting Biden and Harris, and who have radical mentors who say it's a step back. You know how do they participate? So. One, you know, what do you think about today's selection? And two, yeah. what is your advice for young people who feel that this is a step back? Yeah, well, I understand it first off, and I, I even I'm I'm sympathetic with that perspective. You know, Joe Biden seemed to have narrowed his possible candidate list down to a few candidates, and the final list that I saw just right before we got on made me think that Kamala Harris was actually perhaps the best person on that short list. And, mm -hmm. and so for everybody who, who is disappointed in it, it's not a big encouraging thing to say, well, listen, it could have been Gretchen Whitmer, who's the governor of, of Michigan, who I have a, I have an active problem with. There's so many problems she has with, with her justice record as well. Or, could have been Susan Rice, who has no overt elected experience and has a deeply problematic record in international affairs. So like there was there's a part of me that looks at Kamala Harris and say, well, I don't know. I think she was actually the best of his finalists. And I've said this publicly many times, like I have major beef with with Kamala's record as district attorney of San Francisco. I, I said I would give it a. Uh, a D plus maybe, you know, I've, I've examined that record. Now I also say that you have to look at her record as DA and not judge it through a 2020 lens 
almost no prosecutors were doing the brave work that we see Chase Boudin doing today in 2020. Almost nobody was doing that in 2005 when she was a district mm-hmm. attorney. And so I don't judge her through a 2020 rubric, but what I have seen since she left office as DA and e- even since she left office as attorney general, every year she's gotten better and better on issues of justice reform. I, now, that may be a bitter pill for people to swallow. I have no, I don't know her. I don't know her team. I say it as as independent of a thinker as I can be. Um, I I heard her this year say that we should end qualified immunity, and I heard her. I said on social media earlier uh, tonight, Jane, that I don't think anybody in the U.S. Senate has said smarter things about the Black Lives Matter movement and police reform this summer over these past three or four months, like very frankly, as somebody who's been super critical of her for years, I was really, really surprised at how sharp and sincere and, and, and refined her policies were and um, way more than Joe Biden and, and her policies and her ideas were really better than almost any elected official I saw. And and so people who don't want to give her another chance or who think, you know, they wished it was uh, Karen Bass or or Mm -hmm. Barbara Lee or someone else Mm -hmm. from California that was more progressive. I get it. Uh, That was what I hoped as well. And it's what most of us who are super progressive would have preferred. Um, Still, though, I, I think she is policy wise significantly better than. N- almost anybody in the United States Senate outside perhaps of uh, outside of Bernie maybe and uh mm-hmm. and on some issues she's she's super sharp and um I'm going to give I'm going to give her a chance but I'm also still going to be a critic you know mm-hmm. like I'm not going to stop critiquing her on issues related to Palestine or issues related to Medicare for all um I don't even know that I'll be endorsing her or Joe Biden. Um, I'll be, I'll be critiquing them. I'll be voting against Trump. And, uh, and yet I understand Mm -hmm. people who, who take either side on that issue. Mm -hmm. You know, something that I'll just add is what you talked about earlier, which is um, if you're not excited about the presidential race, still vote, but get engaged at the down ballot level, find out who's running for school board, who's running for your local city council, who's running for your public transit agency board. And and also this is where we are building the pipeline for the next Bernie Sanders and AOC and Ilhan Omar. I mean, a lot of folks, I mean, AOC is a huge exception. um, And so it's Trump actually for that matter. But many folks start at the very local level. And and this work is going to be the work of decades. And for those of you that are in the Bay Area, we have um, Moms for Housing, co-founder yeah. Carol Fife running for Oakland City Council. Yeah, we have three young Latinx housing, affordable housing and tenant advocates, um, Lacey Amoday, um, Alicia Crater, Nestor Castillo running for Haywood City Council. We have Cheryl Davila running for Berkeley City Council. Um, we have Latifa Simon running for BART Board. She's currently the president. So, you know, get involved in, in those races. Let's build the pipeline so yeah. that we have this bench that yeah. we can continue to support. And, Absolutely. you know, one of my biggest concerns is that if Biden wins, if Biden wins, which I also hope so too, that we all kind of sit back and we're like, all right, we don't have to organize anymore. In some ways, Trump, yeah. the beauty or the, adva- the, the advantage of Trump was that we all got organized because we couldn't yeah. step back. And so for those of you that aren't excited about Biden, Kamala, the fight doesn't end on November 3rd. No, you no. have to hold them accountable. Yep. Yeah to the agenda that we care about and we move them. Yeah. And, and if they do win, there'll be a new U S Senator in California. There's an opportunity for us to fight for someone brilliant and progressive that Mm -hmm. really represents the new California in that seat. And there are Jane, you said it, there are brilliant people running for office all over the country so even though I'm not, I, I'm not over the top excited about this. I am, I am excited about people who are running for office 
all over the Bay, all over California, right here in New York where I am. And so I'm not unplugging. And even even as you know, you and I campaigned, you, you worked for Bernie, we campaigned for Bernie, even with and I'm still disappointed. I, hell, I'm still disappointed over 2016. <laughs> and uh, like I, I don't get over those losses very easily. Even with that, I just refuse to completely unplug from it all. Like the moment is too important. And I never want to look back on this time, which I think 2020 is one of the most difficult years in the modern history of the world. I don't want to look back on this year and say, damn, I wish I really had been more involved. I wish I had done more. And um, I said some kind things about Kamala on social media earlier. And there were a lot of progressives and others who were frustrated by it. And it's like, listen, I have to say how I feel. I have to say what I'm thinking. Um, you, you know. We can't be so blinded sometimes by our political philosophy or worldview. And I want you to have an established worldview that it causes you to miss an opportunity to see something that could be good. And um, so for me, you know, I am still excited that a, a, a woman could be vice president. I am still excited that a black woman that it could be vice president. You know, like all of that Asian American woman. That's right. And no, and and it's not nothing. And uh, I know we often fight against identity politics alone because for us, philosophy matters, politics matter. But it is very exciting to see a woman who comes from uh, two immigrant parents um, be able to grow and thrive and lead and be nominated for vice president. She's also the first vice president nominee in the Democratic Party, I think I saw ever from California. And there, that there had never been a, a nominee for vice president from California. There have been people run. And, uh, and so there are things to be excited about, but all of our nerves are frayed and everybody is super frustrated just in general. And it can cause you to even miss a moment that means something, you know, and even people think it's symbolic or whatever. I think the nomination matters. And um, I am I am hoping uh, Joe Biden is about as as moderate as a Democrat could be. I'm hoping that her policies and positions uh, make him better and bring him left. And so uh, even if people Mm -hmm. aren't supercharged about her there, there's a lot there that's still worth celebrating, I think. Well, one of the reasons why I joined Bernie 2020 um, a year ago was because I knew Bernie was a winner, whether he won the nomination or not. And we saw that at every debate, his, the agenda that he has put forward, which is our agenda, dominated the debate questions. Every question was on Medicare for all and eliminating student debt and free college. And as a progressive activist, it was really amazing to hear these questions get asked in 2020 because they would have never thought about asking these questions in 2008 or even 2016. Yeah. And so we have to keep fighting because whether the candidate that we get to select is that progressive stalwart or not, we can change the conditions around that candidate. And, and hopefully we can make Biden one of the most progressive presidents um, we've had in this country because of the conditions that we've put in place and giving him that mandate yeah. um, to lead in that way. Um, and I agree with you. I, as someone who supported an old white man for the democratic nomination, I did say one of the most empowering things for me was to actually watch the debate and see women to see people of color, see Andrew Yang yeah. up on that stage. It Absolutely. was, I, I, I actually, I, I wasn't expecting it. We were at the same debate watch party with Chessa yeah. And it was my first time seeing Andrew actually on broadcast TV and I got emotional. Yeah. You know, he's not my candidate, but you no, know, but it matters. It does to matter. See his face. Um, yeah. And for me, it's not that I wanted, it had to be a person of color, a woman that I supported, but as a woman of color to have the choice yeah. that I could pick a woman that I yeah. could pick a person of color, but I picked the person that I, I identified with in terms of my politics. So the fact that I could have chosen, a Kamala Harris and Andrew Yang was incredibly important to me too. And yeah. so I think that we got to continue to fight for that. And now 
we have run out of time and yeah. um, it's an informed tradition to ask all the speakers the following question. What is your 60 second idea to change the world? Oh, wow. That's a great question. You know, I did not know that was a question or I would have prepared a perfect 60 second answer. <laughs> but I'll, I'll start here. Um, changing the world begins with a decision. And that decision is you choosing the cause that you want to impact the most. And if you look, when I say the word leaders, most people think of elected officials. But when you look at the most effective leaders, and they're, they're normally not elected officials, the most effective leaders in the world have put their foot down on a very specific cause. It might be the environment. For me, it's police brutality and mass incarceration. It might be women's issues. Uh, I'm here at my house. My wife has chosen childhood literacy. But until you decide, like, you know what, this is the thing that I'm going to use my life my time, my skills, my resources, my network, my money. This is the thing that I am going to fight for, to fight against. You'll just be floating above the surface of a lot of issues. And I'll close with this, this thought, Jane. To me, the greatest evidence of, of the reality that you have chosen a cause to fight for is not when you tell me what that cause is. It's if I ask your friends, if I ask your family, if I ask the people around you, hey, what is her cause or what's his cause? Because you can tell me, well, I've chosen this or that. But when you've really chosen it, everybody around you will know. Your friends, your coworkers, your colleagues, your neighbors, because you'll be fighting for it with everything in you, with every ounce and every fiber of your being. And so I encourage everybody who sees this now or later, uh, live life on purpose, choose a cause, choose an issue, and just drill down deeply. The world really needs specialists who will fight until they see change in that issue. Thank you, Sean. I, I just want to say in my years of watching you, um, I have been incredibly struck both by your tenacity and your generosity. So thank you. Um, thank you so much. And we need many, many more Sean Kings in this world. Uh, make change. Um, go to your local bookstore. Support your community. Um, you can go to Amazon also to purchase the book, but think about, you know, how we use our dollars to That's right. um, grow the world that we want to see. And um, let's see, I just want to make sure I cover all the announcements. If you'd like to watch more virtual programs or support the Commonwealth Club's effort in making virtual programming, please visit commonwealth.org. Um, really wish we could have done this in person, but, you know, honestly, just hearing your voice in my, in my earbuds, there's something so intimate also about this conversation. And so, and I'm, I really appreciate that we have this larger and wider audience in some ways that can join in because That's the right. programming is online. I think you have another event after this one. I do. Um, follow <laughs> follow Sha, uh, Sean King, at Sean King on Twitter and, and on Instagram. I'm at Jane, uh, at Jane Kim and um, Inform San Francisco. Thank you so much for having both of us. And I can't wait to welcome you and your family back to the Bay. That's right. And, the work continues. Thank you all very much for attending tonight. Thank you. Take care. Thank you.